Writing about crime contains themes and subjects that some may find upsetting. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, I'm your host, Bonnie Lee, and this is Writing About Crime. Telling the Christine Jack story would be impossible without John D. Montgomery. He's a former chief prosecutor for the city of Winnipeg, who wrote the book Trials and Errors, The People vs. Brian Gordon Jack. Clutching the steering wheel of the Chevy Blazer, he's driving through the suburbs, with cargo in the back that he doesn't want anyone to know about. It's the dead of winter in Winnipeg, Manitoba, or as they call it, Winterpeg. He's dressed in his winter clothing and he's focused on driving cautiously and not swerving between the lines or failing to make a complete stop at every stop sign. He isn't giving anyone a reason. It's creeping into an unearthly hour and the streets are almost empty. It's only just over a week before Christmas. His daughter and her brother are at home, hopefully sleeping. As he weaves up on the overpass above the train tracks on the other side of a sign saying, Welcome to Winnipeg. Fermore Avenue becomes Highway Number 1, the Trans-Canada Highway. As the sign begins to disappear in his rearview mirror, he begins to notice his breathing is regulating. Either time gave him his breath back, or simply seeing the broad side of the highway reaching into the black. The prairies are so flat, you can almost see the Canadian shield in your mind's eye if you look hard enough. He's considering that may be where this trip takes him. Possibly. He pulls up to the last set of traffic lights before the road turns into an expressway with no stops until Ontario, if you want to go straight through. He's at Deacon's Corner, the rest stop for truckers coming in and out of the city. He looks over to the Salisbury house and the well-lit gas station, and it reminds him that he's driving a ticking time bomb. Not because of the haul, but because of what's under the hood of his vehicle. For weeks, it's been running hot, and it's only a matter of time before it breaks down, but not tonight. He has one chore to get through and back home. Then the damn thing can blow up if it wants. The light turns green and he accelerates through the intersection, satisfied when nobody pulls up beside him. No one is going to spot him now, not with any certainty. And he pushes along forward to the east and lights are behind him and the road ahead is black. He's alone with his thoughts and the telltale heart in the back of the vehicle, but he barely notices. His palms are sweaty now. How far is enough? Where makes the least sense to turn off the highway onto a feeder road? Manitoba. There is no fucking trees along the prairies. His mind is running on those ideas, but it's running in the wrong way because just up in the front line of his vision, Smoke is beginning to cloud up above his hood. There's a drag in the engine, and it feels like a sputter is coming on. And he panics. It's only just over half an hour out of the city. Should he turn off, maybe, towards Steinbach? He's fooling himself. He will never make it that far. And he hits the overpass and sees an exit to the number 12 highway. If the blazer is going to pop, he can't be on the main highway. He just needs to get somewhere where he's less observable. The puff of smoke is not relenting and he's searching for anywhere to pull over. But he's stuck and he's going off the turnoff to the 207 that runs straight into St. Anne. He thought it was closer to Steinbach, but here he is. And after a short hike of what feels like hours, but actually is not much longer than it takes to straighten your wheels, He sees the lights. He's already in town, it seems. And the St. Anne Hotel 
creeped right up on his left, and not a second too soon. He's crawling into the parking lot between the hotel and the gas station on the other side. He opts for a spot closer to the station, but locks up, and then walks towards the hotel. The beer parlor is open, and it's in full swing. Somebody in there has to know someone. Reminding himself not to act too desperate is pointless. His natural demeanor is stone-faced, and he can be anxious, but that's okay. He's driving a broken down vehicle. It won't seem unnatural. He walks to the bar and he sees the female bartender at the end and she's pouring drinks and she thankfully has a friendly face. She can help. He tells her his vehicle is giving him trouble, but her face drops into an empathetic grin and she tells him everything is closed, the gas station and the garage. He looks away, and he grumbles for an OV, and as she cracks the bottle, the guy that runs the place notices an unknown face and begins sauntering over towards the both of them. He's equally empathetic, because everything is closed. It's creeping on midnight after all. He suggests a call to the local garage owner when he hears that the unknown patron will pay anything that he has to if someone can get the blazer on the road. He has to get to Kenora to pick up a truck overnight. He was optimistic he could get one last ride out of there without problems, but it's apparent that he was mistaken. Good fortune comes his way when the garage owner agrees to head over and take a look under the hood to see if there's a solution to this guy's problem. He sits with his beer, feeling anxious but keeping his eyes down and his face expressionless. It's a long 15 minutes. But the mechanic arrives, and he has his son-in-law in tow. They head out the door, and there's a noticeable exchange as they realize that the blazer is parked almost near the gas station. The parking lot has plenty of space. He keeps his head down and tells them he will follow them and take their lead to the garage as they hook him up for a tow. He takes a brief look into the back window as he opens the door, but nothing is detectable in the darkness of the back seat. Unless you look a little closer. Brian Gordon Jack was born in Ottawa, Ontario on May 23rd, 1947. His father was a retired police officer who worked with the OPP, the Ontario Provincial Police. He received a scholarship at Lenore Rhine College in Hickory, North Carolina, and graduated with a bachelor degree in economics and physical education. And while in school, he met Nancy Sporer, his first wife, and they married in 1969. After he completed his studies, they moved to Canada, where he played professional football with the Ottawa Rough Riders, and then was in Montreal for a stint in 1973. He finally found himself in Manitoba playing for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in 1974 and 1975. And then he and Nancy divorced in 1977. She kept custody of the two children they had, and they remained with her as he supported them. And in 1978, he met Christine Anna Ryder. And they married on August 23, 1980. They have two children, Adam and Kirsten, two years apart, and they buy a home in the St. Patel area a year or so after Kirsten was born. During the decade after he was done playing pro football, he was running a handful of fitness and pro shops throughout the city. He hit a tough spot when one outfit was bankrupt and his locations were closed. He was able to secure the stock and was making money by selling the inventory under Brian's Racket and Sportswear. At that point, he was struggling to work in sports retail, and he wasn't feeling it was a secure way to make money, so he closed up shop and supplemented his income by substitute teaching in the community. He was unemployed and so far wasn't seeing much opportunities for full-time work yet. Christine, however, was doing well with her career, 
She was a speech therapist for a local school division and was able to keep the bills paid with that income and a little kid's clothing line that she set up with her friend Cheryl McMillan. Brian says the two weeks before she went missing, she and Cheryl went to Grand Forks for the weekend. When she returned, she was distant and uncommunicative, and she told him that she didn't really have any feelings for him, and she withdrew. They used the guidance of a therapist, Dr. James McPhee, and they saw him together twice, where Brian was surprised to hear that Cheryl was struggling with the relationship for a long time already. She was feeling bitter about him not helping around the house and helping with the children. And Brian wasn't aware that on the 14th of December, she would visit a lawyer to discuss her options in regards to ending the marriage after eight years together. On December 15th, they had what would be their final session with Dr. James McPhee. And it was agreed that somehow they would need to come to an arrangement where Cheryl could have some space. By the 16th of December, Christine wrote her mom and dad a letter describing the state of her relationship. She says people at work have been supportive and she describes how a neighbor, Maria, came by her office the day before to tell her that she felt Christine had done everything she could and that it was unfair of Brian to behave the way he was. Lastly, she says that she had been to a lawyer the previous day who deals with separation and divorce and that things may be better for her than she thought initially. She needs to get Brian to move out in January. And he told her that he can't because he doesn't have the money. They would have to sell the house first. She was encouraged that the lawyer told her he could be removed by court order rather than waiting. And her and the children could remain in the house regardless of his finances. On the last day of the school session before Christmas break, Christine left at 3.30 and she seemed happy, and nobody had any reason to be suspicious of something going on. No reason to be suspicious, but it would be the last time that anyone ever saw her again. Here's what Brian said happened that night. It was December 17th, a Saturday, and he claims that they rented movies to watch with the kids, and then later, around 9 o'clock at night, they got into a discussion about what the future living arrangements would be. She cried and said she couldn't really handle living with him anymore, and said that she was kind of thinking he should move out. He said she was sobbing uncontrollably, and he tried to console her, but she was overly emotional. When he approached her to comfort her, she jumped back and wouldn't allow him to be near her. He said there was no yelling or any physical interception, but when she put her coat on and headed for the door, he knew she was going to be leaving. He followed her to the garage and tried to ask her where she was going, but she refused to acknowledge him. She used her keys for the blazer, got inside, and drove out. And it was the last time he saw her. She was heading down Alberg towards Britannica Street. And it was about 9.50 p.m. at that point. Brian Jack said that after Christine left, he made coffee and watched the news. He said he pulled out the vacuum cleaner just to pass the time. I guess this is when... He decided he was going to help out with the housework. And then by three in the morning, he went to a neighbor's, Donna Henry. She just lived down the street a few houses, and he knocked on the door but claimed nobody answered. So he hung around for 15 minutes or so and said that he looked for traffic. After the 15 minutes, he went home and his kids were just coming down the stairs and asking where he was. He said they cuddled on the couch, and then he put them to bed. Brian makes a point of telling the investigators that the time between putting the kids to bed and when he started phoning around to see if anyone knew where she was, 
He was cleaning and doing all the washing to keep himself busy. Brian says that between 4.30 and 6 in the morning, he calls Cheryl McMillan and Donna Mae Henry. He also calls Faye Harden and Christine's aunt, Lydia, who lived in Selkirk, but they were very close. Lydia was actually a family friend, but Christine thought of her as an auntie. Brian Jack says he then called the police, but he didn't know what time. He was told to wait at least a day or so to see if she just returns on her own. But he tells investigators that he spoke to everyone he could think of and mentions that on the same day, he had been out driving through parking lots looking for the blazer. Now that investigators are involved, they decide to go talk to Aunt Lydia. And she says she did receive a call from Brian at around 5, 10 a.m., it was Sunday, and she was certain about the time because she had a clock on her nightstand where the phone sat. He told her that he and Christine had been in an argument the night before and that they were screaming at each other. He told her about the fight and how she wanted him to leave, but he didn't have another place to go, so he was staying with her at the house for now. And he said that they continued to scream at each other and then she grabbed the keys and left with her purse. This was interesting to investigators because his initial claims were that there was no yelling and no screaming. But when he speaks to Lydia, he's expressing to her that there was a lot of yelling and screaming at each other. Investigators continue trying to determine where Christine Jack has disappeared to. And they move on to talk to the close neighbors, Donna May and her husband, Peter. Donna tells investigators that she too had spoken to her close friend, Christine, on that Saturday evening, closer to 7.30 p.m. She said Christine sounded really happy and that it was around the time that she was getting the kids ready to go to bed. Nothing sounded unusual and she had no reason to feel alarmed at all. Until the next morning, it was about 5.30 or 6 in the morning, when Peter answered a call, and it was Brian on the phone. Peter told Brian that they hadn't seen Christine, and had no idea where she was. Brian told him about the argument, but this time he said he only got home at 10 o'clock, and they argued, so she left the house shortly after at around 10 or after 10. He mentioned his earlier visit at their place around three in the morning, where he said he knocked on their door, but no one woke up to open it. He told them he already notified police, but he didn't know what else to do. Donna May and her husband Peter went back to bed after the call, but they were woken again by Brian at 8.30 in the morning, saying he still didn't know where Christine was. Brian had claimed that he also spoke to Bud Harden. And he tells the investigators that he and his wife Faye didn't receive a call from Brian that Sunday morning. He said it was impossible that he would have missed the call because they have a phone in the bedroom. He said it was impossible that he would have missed the call because they had a phone in their bedroom. This was before cell phones so there are only phones in certain rooms and it would be unlikely not to hear it ringing in the same room while you're asleep. When investigators refer back to information that they have, they discover that Brian Jack only called the police to inform them that his 33-year-old wife was missing on December 18th at 10.46 in the evening. He told Constable George Frizzell, who was on missing persons that evening, that he and his wife argued and she left around 9 p.m. the previous night. He tells the constable that she's been missing since and none of her friends or family have seen her or heard from her. 
He says she was driving the 1983 yellow Chevrolet Blazer, and he gives the details of what she was wearing and points out that they have two young children at home as well. Brian tells the constable that Cheryl, as well as being very upset, also had a check on her for $2,000 that she hadn't cashed. It was from her job with the Seven Oaks School Division. And while Brian strongly noted that his wife was terribly upset, George Frizzell was struck by the calm demeanor of the caller as he described the situation. By that Sunday night or early Monday morning on the 19th of December, Ronald Hogland and Donald Gresson showed up at Brian and Christine's home to speak to Brian. Brian came to the door and he was seemingly undisturbed and rather quiet. The officers told him that they were there to gather some information, so they were invited in to speak with him. They noticed that he didn't seem to assume when they arrived that they had located Christine or had any new information, which was unusual for someone who would be really concerned about a missing person. When they left, they left with a sense of perplexion. That next morning on the Tuesday, December 20th, before lunch, two new constables came to Jack's home and they wanted more information so that they could try to continue on with the search for the missing mother and wife. Yes, he had reached her mother in New Jersey, and no, Christine didn't have another relationship that he knew of. He was certain something was wrong because she would never leave the two children behind, especially during the holiday season, no matter how angry she was. The constables left, and then on Thursday, Detective Jay Paquette made a trip to the home in the morning to investigate for more details. Now Christine has been gone over three days, so the investigation is more serious than ever. Any details could help, and he was hoping that something Brian may not have mentioned before could be the key to locating Christine. Again, yet another member of the police service is struck by Brian's lack of concern. And so, he has Brian repeat the details of the evening that she went missing. Brian has the same account that he had from the beginning, and nothing seems particularly concerning about his retelling of all the events. There is one added detail, though, and it's that Brian mentions making coffee after Christine left, but in his emotional state after Christine left so hastily, he accidentally spilled coffee on the couch cushions in the living room. He said he fell asleep there waiting for Christine to come home, Brian Jack isn't seemingly distressed, but he's adamant that Christine would not likely just leave, especially with the children being behind at the Christmas season. But as a precaution, a DNR or dial number recorder is put on the telephone in the Brian Jack residence. With no real leads, a media bulletin is then put out to the newspapers, radio, and television. There's an arrangement of photos, and one is of Christine and three different views of the 1983 Chevrolet Blazer S10. It's a bright yellow color with black pinstriping along the panels. The communique mentions it may have been operated on the Trans-Canada Highway between Winnipeg and Falcon Lake in the late hours of December the 17th, going early into December 18th. Now, Detective Paquette is starting to zone in, and he decides to go back to Cheryl McMillan and ask her some more questions. When he reaches her, she tells him that she has known Christine since she was 15 years old, and they've always been close. She had no knowledge of Christine using any drugs or abusing alcohol, and she had never known her to have issues with her mental health. Cheryl tells Paquette that... Brian had brought the children to her at around midday the Monday after Christine went missing. It was shortly after the two officers that were by Brian's home to talk with him, and Adam, his son, went home the Wednesday after that while she kept Kirsten with her and her husband to take care of her while everyone was trying to locate her missing mother. 
Cheryl was questioned later on, and she was more dreary at that time. She told detectives that it was unimaginable to her that Christine would not contact her, regardless of how serious the argument was with Brian. She didn't think that Cheryl would leave the children either, and something didn't feel right about all of it. Cheryl expressed worry and even claimed that she felt Christine may be dead. She also shared another piece of striking information that would prove valuable. Brian had mentioned in the past that the blazer wasn't in very good working condition. She felt uneasy thinking back to his comments about how something may have happened to her if she was stranded on the highway. That same Thursday, the missing person's case for Christine Jack was expanded into a possible homicide investigation. It wasn't because of any real physical evidence, but because of the picture painted when all of the involved members of the department rounded up and looked at the information together during a meeting with the detective division. That Thursday afternoon, it was decided that Sergeant Edward Polishin and Detective Lauren Shinko would visit Brian and they'd gather another statement to compare with the notes that they had so far. Christine's co-workers were confused about the situation, and at the time, there was no social media, so there was a lot of calling between friends that worked with Christine, and they were very concerned about the situation. During the sergeant and detective's visit with Brian Jack that evening, they worked on him to get every detail and nail down his timeline. Not only on the day of Christine's disappearance, but of his specific movements before and after who he spoke to, and when and what he did in between. They found him suspicious in the end, and while they saw he was seemingly honest, his body language was a tell. They also noted a noticeable reaction when they suggested a helicopter could be helpful in the search. He was quick to point out the redundancy of it, and he said it had snowed and... It will be all white now. By Friday, December 23rd, things were not looking good. There was no real leads. And despite some suspicious behavior, there really was no real information that was going to help locate Christine Jack. Then, suddenly at 5.17 p.m., Something happened that was going to take the investigation into a straighter projectile. A strange call was recorded by a police dispatcher, where an apparently confused caller reported that he'd observed the snow-colored yellow blazer at a Salisbury House coffee shop in the St. Vitale area. The caller seemed unwilling to give his name, but eventually relented and gave the name Henry and would not disclose any more information about his identity, which struck the dispatcher as unusual. Normally, a helpful citizen that discovers a vehicle involved in a highly reported missing persons case would be expected to be more accommodating, especially considering they were coming forward to provide information. But, in fact, it turned out that the caller was right. In the parking lot of the coffee house, the yellow blazer was sitting covered in snow, with the keys in the ignition and the doors unlocked. Inside and outside, it appeared quite dirty, and it was noticed that there were markings on the bumper, similar to those resembling the marks left after being towed by a tow truck. The blazer was loaded onto a flatbed truck and brought in for examination. At 9.30 p.m. that evening, Brian Jack contacted the police youth division, asking about the blazer being found. He said Cheryl McMillan had told him that someone discovered it. While the sergeant thought it was odd that Brian contacted a totally different division, he confirmed that Cheryl McMillan was right. The blazer had been found that day. Things heated up, though, when it was discovered that the suspicious-sounding call informing them of the location came from 170 Arberg Drive, Brian and Christine Jack's home. Even more dubious was a report that Detective Schinkel reviewed that day. It disclosed that after consulting with Cheryl McMillan, 
she had absolute certainty that she had not contacted Brian about the discovery of the blazer because she had no idea that it was found. Then, later upon review of the vehicle, before forensics came in to inspect the vehicle, Polish and noticed what appeared to be blood smears on the driver's side door. In a strange turn of events, two waitresses at the Charter House, an upscale steak and seafood restaurant in the center of the city, observe a blonde woman who's seated dining alone. She orders a pricey seafood meal and doesn't touch it. The waitresses are positive that she looks very similar to the photos that they've seen circulating in the media of the missing woman, Christine Jack. They call in a tip, but it's a long while before anyone makes the time to visit them and collect a statement. Police are already hot on the trail of Brian Jack, and there are volumes of tips coming in as the investigation unfolds. Those tips are triaged through the departments, and this tip doesn't alarm anyone in the police service. It falls into that category of a most likely mistaken identity, and the investigators have no reason to believe that Christine is even possibly alive. It seems to be a red herring and falls into someone's notes somewhere. Following the discoveries about the blazer and the phone calls, it was time to question Brian Jack about the blazer. He denied knowing anything about it or the phone call, but when he's pressed and faced with the revealed DNR evidence of the call coming from his home, he gives up and he tells investigators, So I called it in. So what? Sergeant Polishin decides to address the blood found in the vehicle and he asks Brian about his outdoors activities, like hunting and fishing. Initially, Brian tells him he isn't really into that stuff, but when it's pointed out that he has a trapper's license and that there was blood in the vehicle when they examined it, he loosens up, and he said he did recently shoot a deer. Because he didn't have a knife, he put it in the back of his blazer. He claimed the deer had been cut up now, so he couldn't tell them where it was, and when he was asked why he didn't mention that they may find blood in the vehicle, he retorted that he didn't know all of the details he was supposed to offer before they asked. Brian Jack was informed that now that he was in custody, he would lose custody of his children. Now they would be looking for the person who could tell them where to find Christine. One of the officers commented that the only one who knew where it was white all over could really know. The smart-alecky Brian Jack responded, Hey, you guys have a tough job. Before dinner time, on December 25th, 1998, the police service acquired a warrant to search Brian Jack's residence. Six officers were on hand to scour the four-level home. At first, forensic officers couldn't see any evidence of a struggle or a physical fight, leaving any markings or damaging furniture. Until someone discovered red-stained stuffing coming from a living room couch and on the flip side of a cushion, which smelled freshly cleaned. Human blood was discovered on a throw blanket that was folded up, and there was blood on a vase as well as some detected on the carpet. All of these items would need to be submitted for testing. Although that Christmas night, investigators were pretty certain that Brian Jack was involved in Christine's disappearance, he couldn't be kept in remand without something more solid. They would have to wait for the testing to come back and they release Brian for the interim. On his way to being released near 2 o'clock in the afternoon, almost 20 hours after he'd been brought in, Brian Jack had that air of ignorance, like someone who can't see far enough ahead to know that he's about to be in really deep trouble. He's told his home was searched, and the results from that search, as well as the vehicle samples, will be in within two days. 
He's also informed that his children, Kirsten and Adam, are put into temporary housing. This didn't elicit a big reaction from Brian, even though it was a pretty dark and certain outcome. So he's released from custody and put on surveillance that was intended to be quite visible, just so he knew where the investigator's eyes were looking. Fifteen officers were added to the area to go door to door and interview the neighbors to see if anyone saw anything suspicious. Later that Christmas night, Brian Jack opens the door to reporters looking for a comment on the case. And he appears shaken. And he says, I can't talk about it, I'm too upset. Well, Brian isn't the only one upset. Al Kircher speaks to reporter Lisa Priest, and he tells her as a supervisor at the child guidance clinic that Christine worked at, that everyone kept hoping that she'd gone away for a little while just to blow off steam but it isn't like her to not come back for Christmas. He claimed she was well-liked among her peers, and all of them were very concerned, because they felt that she was a very dedicated mother and wife, saying everybody liked her. On December 26th, Brian Jack is arrested, and later charged with his wife's slaying. After Boxing Day, the Tuesday, December 27th, back at the St. Anne Hotel, it's getting late. The television is on in the beer parlor. Paul St. Marie and Jim Hudrick have a visible reaction to the news bulletin that has a photo of an attractive 30-ish missing young woman and photos of a yellow blazer that she may have been driving. The two men agree that there's no doubt that the blazer was the one they helped the stranded patron get running the week before. And before midnight that Tuesday, Hudrick contacted the Winnipeg Police Service. They make an arrangement to meet in the city at the garage where the blazer was in storage so that they can give details to the investigators about what they saw that night. That Wednesday morning, December 28th, Paul St. Marie and Jim Hudrick are waiting for the two sergeants in the early morning. And at the same time, Detective Schinkel is gathering photos to put together a lineup that will show if the two witnesses can correctly identify the driver. And this is game time. Both Paul and Jim meet Constable Lawrence Crichton and Sergeant Williams at 9 in the morning and the two witnesses were able to inspect the vehicle, and there was no doubt that this was the blazer they worked on. There was the same antifreeze and diesel mix splattered inside the vehicle, and the markings of the trailer hitch were familiar, and it was a rather uncommon one. The two men followed Crichton and Williams into the building after looking at the spread of photos, and Paul St. Marie was 100% certain of one specific photo, and it was of Brian Jack. His friend, however, was less certain. He admitted that he was preoccupied with the repair, so he didn't focus too much on the stranger. The mechanic, however, was positive that that yellow blazer was the one that he worked on. Those discussions resulted in the group going back to St. Anne, and they head to the hotel to look for some evidence of Jack having been there. Physical evidence and maybe even another eyewitness. It was early in the afternoon when Jim Hudrick was ushering the constables into the garage where he tried to repair the blazer. He told them how Brian wouldn't pull the full vehicle into the garage, even though there was plenty of room. He also mentioned that Brian was adamant that he would turn the ignition on and off himself, as well as maneuvering anything with the steering wheel. In order to compare the fluid that was under the hood of the blazer, the constable collected samples from the remaining mixture in the garage. Since they were already in St. Anne, they decided to take Hudrick and St. Marie out to the number one highway 
and just scout out the location where the two men witnessed the suspect driving that night. It wasn't a long drive out of town before the mechanic told them that it had been around midnight that night when they followed the driver out of St. Anne. They told them that the stranger claimed he would pay them for the work they did on the blazer, but his test drive seemed to be taking a long time. The two witnesses claimed that they felt suspicious, so they followed him out of town. They knew they would catch up to him considering the state of the vehicle. As they encroached on him, they found him in the blazer crawling down the highway, and he finally pulled over. At this point, the suspect acted as though he was still test driving the vehicle, and he gave them the cash. They were suspicious of him, feeling that he really had no intention of coming back to give them the money. But when they were hot on his tail, he would pull over. Strange guy, and very suspicious. The two decided on following him for a couple of miles up the highway. From what they were seeing, that blazer was not going to make it to Kenora, 160 kilometers away. They told investigators that if he was planning to drive the blazer back to the city, he wouldn't have gone much farther than where they were. The group returned back to St. Anne and they tried to find some other folks that were around that night to get more eyes on the photos and have some more support and confirmation from other patrons. They struck out that night, but the following day, Roger Pelod confirmed a photo saying he was pretty sure. Brenda Appleyard, the bartender that night, picked out Brian's photo right away. She knew her memory was right about the date because that was the night that the Ken D band played in the hotel. And investigators knew we are on the right path now. The investigation is winding up, but the trial is just beginning. Part two of the Christine Jack story will be up in the next couple of days. It's been quite a run since my last episode, and I wasn't really positive that I would be coming back, but these are the people who left messages and reviews and nice notes <laughs> that encouraged me to make sure I came back. Gina G for messaging on Facebook, along with Renee C. Patsy H for her encouraging email. Catherine B for the lovely note on Facebook and a really nice review. Rick J for his comments on my YouTube channel. Hello, oh, I'm gonna say Hello Falls <laughs> from Australia. Marion H from Canada. Miles Teaches from the United States, and Mr. Prudent from the United States as well. I also want to mention uh, Laura from the Ivy League Murders podcast. They have a new podcast, and she was messaging back and forth with me a little bit, and their new podcast is pretty good. I hope you check it out. My recommendations this week are Nothing Ever Happens in Canada, a Canadian podcast looking to explore the myths, legends, and just good old tales that Canada has to tell. As well as the Fresh Hell podcast, Murder, Mystery, and the Macabre. You can hear promos for both of those podcasts now. Thank you so much for continuing to listen to the podcast. You'll hear part two of the Christine Jack story in the next couple of days. Welcome to Nothing Ever Happens in Canada, and I'm Canadian Girl. Do you like adventures, myths, legends, and learning about some of Canada's greatest moments in history? Well then this is the podcast for you. Join me every two weeks as we travel around Canada, exploring things like mermaids, giants, lost gold mines, and we even stop once in a while to observe historical events and people. Come on over to the channel and join the crew by hitting that subscribe button today. You don't want to miss out on our next adventure. I'm Annie from Boston, Massachusetts. And I'm Johanna from Vienna, Austria. We are the hosts of Fresh Hell, your international podcast that covers murder, mystery, and the macabre throughout history. Are you interested in the 3,569 ways your household could have killed you in the Victorian era? Do you know how malaria and syphilis played a role in the John List family murders? 
And have you ever wondered what Prince Albert's sex chair had to do with the murder of Stanford White? Okay, nothing. It had nothing to do with it. We're still telling you about it, though. It's a pretty great sex chair. If you're looking for another show that talks about Ted Bundy, this is probably not the podcast for you. But if you're looking for two women that cover lesser-known cases from all over the world with a lot of background information. So much background information that you will rock your local pub quiz from now on. Then find Fresh Hell Podcast on your favorite podcast app. We also have German Cannibals. See you soon. Tschüss.